Okay, we're beginning this week, Shavuot Tov, everybody, with a Mayamur, a Hasidic discourse from a book called Torah Or, as in the previous weeks. And this week, it's uh, about the Torah portion, Kitisa, which is this week's Torah portion. And uniquely, this week's Torah portion talks about a very touchy subject, very touchy subject, and that is the sin of the golden calf. Sin of the golden calf, the Torah does not um, hide this terrible fact of this terrible sin from uh, the public. God wants everybody to know that the Jewish people did this terrible sin and God wanted to wipe them all out. And because there was Moses <coughs> that prayed for them, as God, he changed God's mind. Moses changed God's mind. And um, right, what, what, <clears throat> so this whole uh, shameful story is told to us in very great detail over here. And it begins even more, it begins by telling us of. Um, how the first tablets that Moses made were the, the handiwork of God and that the letters were the letters of God and that Moses <clears throat> received them out of after 40 days and 40 nights of not eating and tremendous efforts we read about previously how he took the Jews out of Egypt only to serve God. That was the whole thing. At the burning bush, God said, I'm going to take you out of Egypt in order to serve me and you're going to receive the Torah and you serve me on this mountain. That's what God said. And the, the Jews at the Mount Sinai, they all heard God say, don't worship other gods, only the God that took, me out of, took you out of Egypt. I'm the God that took you out of Egypt. Don't worship any other gods. And they did it. Just 40 days, it says the Boshesh Moshe. And the reason they did it was because they thought that Moses was dead. How that fits together, we'll talk about that. <clears throat> I mean, they knew God was with them. God was doing big miracles for them. God was giving them bread from from uh, from heaven and water from a rock, and he was protecting them with clouds of of uh, glory, honor. And he had taken that about. Everybody was fresh in their minds. He split for them the sea. They had just left Egypt just you know ninety days earlier. It took them fifty days to get to Mount Sinai, and forty days later, Moses was supposed to come down, according to the time they calculated. But they calculated wrong. And so they immediately, right? They just didn't wait. They made this golden calf and everybody started worshiping it either actively or passively. So that's what this Torah portion talks about. Okay, so, so what do we see? We see that <clears throat> uh, tragedy befell the Jewish people because of their deeds, tragedy. And of course, God forgave them. Like God always forgives the Jewish people. But these tragedies make um, <clears throat> make the relationship, they sour the relationship between God and the Jews, and especially between the Jews and the whole rest of the world. The Jews are here in order to convince the whole world to serve the creator of the universe who's creating them and to do what the creator wants. In the Torah, and the non-Jews have what's called the seven Noahide commandments. And if the Jews do these terrible sins, God wipes them out. So, you know, after all the miracles that God did for the Jews, and they don't do what God wants, so what do you want from the rest of the world? Okay, so let's talk about this. There is a book in Judaism which is called Shir Hashirim. We've talked about this before. Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs. It's one of the three books that King Solomon wrote. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes and the book of Proverbs and the book of Shir Hashirim. The book of Shir Hashirim, Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs, is totally mystical. It's totally allegory and, and metaphors for the relationship between God and the Jewish people and the Jewish people and God when God took them out of Egypt, when he gave them the Torah, when they were wandering in the desert. <clears throat> they, they built the first temple. When the first temple was built, this was written by King Solomon when, around when the first temple was built. King Solomon built the first temple. This love story of God and the Jewish people and how God is um, 
disappointed by the Jewish people and God looks for the Jewish people and God tries to inspire the Jewish people and the Jewish people look for God and they and they try to, to renew the relationship between God and how deep the relationship is and how genuine the relationship is and how disappointed God is and etc. But it's all an allegory. It's all allegorical and a lot of it is like you say, a love song, male and female. God is usually the male, and, Jew, and the Jewish people are the female. God is the bride, God is the groom, and the Jewish people are the bride, etc. So one of them, it says, <clears throat> I advise everybody, so long, good morning, though. I advise everyone to um, look at it. It's only eight chapters long, very short, eight chapters long. Uh, Shira Shirim, Song of Songs. In the second, second eight paragraphs long, in the second paragraph, the second chapter of Shira Shirim, and the chapters are also very short, but you'll see they're not understandable. You can't understand it at all. In the second uh, chapter, <clears throat> so uh, it, it has the sentence. It says, Smolo tachat laroshi, God's left arm is under my head. The Amino Tahabkeni and his right arm embraces me. God's left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Okay, now we all know <clears throat> that God does not have a form, and we know that God creates everything. And he's much above being a form or defined or having any sort of limitation. God creates all form, all limitation. God creates all existence, and he creates it constantly. In fact, time itself is a creation. We've said this how many times before. That's a very main point of all these mimorium that we're learning over here, about Hasidut in general, to understand what exactly God is, what we're supposed to be worshiping, what the whole world is supposed to be worshiping. <clears throat> so we're saying that God doesn't have a form, but on the other hand, God created us in his image. And we see that the whole Bible is filled with the interaction of God and the Jews, and also in the non-Jews. Also in the non-Jews, we see the story of Nineveh, right? That he would, God was angry at them, and, and Jonah, Jonah the prophet prophesied, and they, they they repented, and God recanted. He took back his decision to destroy them. How he destroyed the Egypt with the ten plagues, and etc. <clears throat> So we see that there is this sort of relationship between God and the Jewish people. And it's not sort of a relationship. It's the ultimate relationship that God really reacts to what we do. At least we have to believe that he does. And if we think about it a little bit, I mean, he doesn't exactly give us when we want and what we want, but he always gives us when we need and what we need. So one of the things sometimes that we need is the last thing that we want, and that is difficulties and punishments and hardships, and, and that's called God's left arm. When bad things happen, God forbid, it should never happen anything bad to anybody. But when they do happen, you have to know that this is God's left arm. And this is, is under my head. <clears throat> and his right arm, God's right arm, he embraces me. Okay, what does it mean? Let's go. In a be, behold, Be'inyan, Ha'olamot, the worlds. Just like God with the, the, creates the worlds. Ken, Derech, Hashem, Levin Israel. So it is the way of God with the Jewish people. Am Krovo. <clears throat> Lamaila above. I'm oh, sorry. Skip. Bnei Yisrael, Am Karovo, Kishemit Ora. When there is aroused, Lamaila above, Bechinat Small Docha, God's left arm, which is called the left arm, which limits left the left side, <coughs> kabbalistically and etc., is the severe side, the limiting side. When there is aroused this level of small doche, machmas maisa tachtoni, because of what we do, the Ehilehem, the Moshiach, 
Begorim, <coughs> and they have to have someone to save them. Sha'adarab al Yadezir, by means of this, Yelaem Nasias Rosh, it'll elevate them. Okay, what, take an example. What do we see in the what's called the judges? Read sometime the book of Judges. There were like 15 judges. <clears throat> and one of them, the last of them was, was Samson, famous ones. Devorah was one of them. Gilad. Utniel. You read, 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 read it in English. You can read it in English. What happened was is that the Jewish people entered the land of Israel with Joshua. Everything was wonderful. And then Joshua dies and the Jewish people sort of lapse into, <clears throat> uh, how do you say, into not caring. There's a word for it, I can't remember the word. And uh, they worship idols. But there's all these non-Jews around them and they're all worshiping idols. And so the Jews try it also, and it works, it works. They worship idols and, and it's good. And they get all sorts of benefits and all sorts of things. Right? Like a person takes drugs, it works, they work. <clears throat> but the problem is, what happens when a person worships idols? He thinks about himself. He doesn't try to feel God creating. I mean, God is, is creating us. So he, he takes his mind off of the things that he's getting from God, life, eyes, ears, nose, mouth. Takes his mind off of God and thinks only about himself. That's what, that's what idolatry is. Thinks about himself. What am I going to get? Am I going to go to heaven? Am I going to... When the Jewish people did that, then because of their deeds, then they get small docha. Then they get bad things. Bad things happen to them. And then God has to save them. And he sends, has to send one of these shoftim, these, these judges. And the judge... <clears throat> rallies the Jewish people, organizes their armies, goes into battle, and miraculously wins. And then the Jewish people return back to God <coughs> until that judge dies. And then they go, etc. That's how it is all the time. So it says that when the Jewish people do against God's will, and then God gives them a punishment, small docha, and then God saves them, as by means of this, Yehelehem, the Sias Rosh, this elevates them. That elevates the Jewish people afterwards. They get a more intimate relationship with God. They have more trust in God. They feel God. They're more aware of the Creator until they return back to the next time. That's what it means. That's what it means. That's what it means. When you lift up the head of the Jewish people, lifkudayim, lifkudayim means to count them, but it also means when something bad happens. Perush al yaday eza pekida, by means of some bad thing, shivkud aleim lara, chas v'shalom, that something a bad thing happens to the Jewish people. The kliya rachman natslan, or there is destruction of the Jewish people. There is no <clears throat> bad thing that happens to the Jews that is not somehow or other connected to the sin of the golden calf. He may behold, all you they by means of this, Adarabah, exactly the opposite. Not This is not a punishment. This is not God saying he doesn't want the Jewish people anymore, that he rejects them, that he has cast them off, that he's, he's disgusted with them, says the Rebbe exactly the opposite. T said, Rosh B'nai Israel, this elevates the head of the Jewish people. He begin a smaller docha, because this, that God shows his left arm, this left arm we talked about before, this left arm which seemingly pushes them away, which shows the Jewish people that they're just like everybody else. And in fact, in fact they're, they're more susceptible to punishment than anywhere else. I don't know if there was any such thing. I'm not a historian. Like the the, 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 the Holocaust, 
Holocaust. I mean, the, I'm sure that Genghis Khan, you know, those people, they, they did their best to wipe out all cities. But they're here, the Jewish people were wiped out, not because of the place that they were or any sort of political considerations <clears throat> or monetary considerations. They were just killed because they were Jews. <clears throat> so, so what's the good of being a Jew? He says, this is a sign. Obviously, this is a sign that somehow or other God is doing this. But don't make the mistake of thinking that this is a sign that God has left us and that we should react accordingly and leave God. God forbid. When God does something bad to the Jewish people, whether collectively or individually, God forbid, it should never be. There's been enough bad already. But nevertheless, you should know that God is not pushing us away totally. It's really in order to make them come closer to him. That's what it means over here. That God embraces me. It says, even though that he falls, he is not <coughs> destroyed. Even though the Jewish people fall and they become very despondent and very, what do you say, depressed from the terrible things that happened to them. But nevertheless, they are not totally destroyed. God always loves them. And the reason these bad things happen is in order to reveal some sort of a new connection. Okay, now this, of course, does not in any way, not, the Rebbe is not trying to explain or to, um, to justify anything bad that happens to the Jewish people. God forbid. And there should only be good things that happen. And the Rebbe, and he's certainly not trying to say that this is a punishment for sins or whatever. But that's the fact. The fact is, somehow or other, you know, what is the cause is that we ignore God. And because of that, God makes us come. It's not good things happen. It comes back. Now, this, again, is not a diatribe against non-religious Jews. In a way, exactly the opposite. In a way, exactly the opposite. First of all, who reads this? Right, only religious Jews are reading it. <clears throat> number one, and it's not to make them feel good when bad things happen to other people. Exactly the opposite. It's to make them feel bad when bad things happen to other people, and to also conclude that it could be that the ones who are really at fault are people like me, religious people, because we know what we're really obligated to do, and we really do believe in God. But we have not given up on our connection to God. And if we do something that's bad, so then, you know, what, 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 what's going to be then? I mean, who's, who are you supposed to look up to? <clears throat> okay, the last person that wants anything bad to happen to the Jews, and there's all sorts of incredible stories about the Baal Shem Tov and his followers, how they did amazing miracles so that a, Jews would not suffer, whether in family, Right, they want children, the amazing blessings they have children, or in health, or in income, money, or in any other way. Amazing miracles that they did in order to help the Jews. And that's the whole thing of Moses, right? To help that the Jews should not suffer. Took them out of Egypt, provided them for with bread in, in, in the desert, did all these amazing things for the Jewish people, just so the Jewish people would benefit. And through that, they would be free to benefit the whole entire world. That's what the Jews are here for, to bring bless, blessing to the world. But we see the Torah even tells us that after all these amazing miracles, and God took them from Egypt and split the sea and gave them bread from heaven, etc., etc. And he gave them the Torah at Mount Sinai. And all the Jewish people were all <clears throat> hyped up. And they said, we'll do everything you said, God, and we'll, we'll do it first, and then we'll understand it. <clears throat> Afterwards, there was this terrible <clears throat> sin of the golden calf, and God immediately says, I'll wipe them all out. Moses, I'm going to wipe out all the Jewish people, and I'll make you a new... I'm not going to wipe out Judaism, totally. No. These people that were there, and that they sinned with the golden calf, whether actively, passively, I'll wipe them all out, and I'll make you into a new nation, Moses. The new nation will come from you. It'll come from you. They'll still be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I mean, you, Moses, you come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? I mean, you're a relative of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So then, but you'll be the new beginner, right? You'll be like Noah was when, when the, after the flood, 
So the same thing, that's what you will be, Moses. Moses said, no way, wipe me out. We'll see. Wipe me, said, I'm not going to. said, if you don't save even the, <clears throat> the, the, the Jewish people, right? The ones that actively sinned, whatever, okay. But all the ones that passively stood by and they just didn't uh, complain, whatever it was, you can't do it. So he got his will. Well, Havi and Indian, let's understand this, Baba was Hashem. Good. What do we, what do we, how do we have to do this? This is a good lesson in history, maybe in, 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 in modern day <clears throat> and the news, you know, something, God forbid, bad happens. We can say, oh, it's probably, you know, I have to just do <clears throat> a little bit better. Let's understand what it means to each and every one of us personally in our personal life, right? With, without all the catastrophes and et cetera. What are we supposed to learn day to day life? Ketiv, <clears throat> it is written, the call called Yaakov, the voice is the voice of Yaakov. This was what uh, Yitzchak, Isaac said to his son Yaakov when he came to steal the blessing that Yitzchak was almost about to give to Esau, which would have been a tragedy, catastrophe. <clears throat> he came in and he said, I, I'm talking to you and, and your, your, your voice is the sound of, of Jacob. As you're saying the name of, you're saying God, God help, it's, uh, with, with God's help, thank God, right? Esau doesn't talk like that. <clears throat> but on the other hand, he put fur on his hands. They put, his mother put fur on his hands. It seems that Esau was an unusually hairy person. She put fur on his hands. It's the hands are the hands of, of Esau. The voice is the voice of Jacob. But the hands are the hands of Esau. But it says, Akol Kol Yaakov. This is what we're left with. The voice is the voice of Yaakov. Two times. He could have said, the voice is of Yaakov. What does he have to say? The voice is the voice of Yaakov. Right? He could have said, your voice is like Jacob. But your hands are like, no, he says, your, the voice, your voice is the voice. Why two times voice? It says the Rebbe, what this is relevant to us. If you look in the Torah, you see that one of them is written with a vav, a call, and the other one is written with a vav, and the other one is written without a vav. One is written, uh, one is written below vav without a vav, and one of them is written with a vav. Key because Beit Kolotim, these are two voices. The Jewish people have two voices, the two voices of Jacob, a call called Yaakov. One is Torah, and the other one is Tefillah. Torah. And to feel it. Both of them are spoken. Spoken word. The power of the spoken word. <clears throat> In a palm omru, sometimes it says the Talmud Torah can get kulam. Sometimes it says that prayer is more important than all. I'm, I'm sorry, that learning Torah, that learning Torah is more important than all of the other commandments. Learning Torah is also a commandment, but learning Torah is the most important commandment. Why is learning Torah the most important commandment? Very simply, because all the commandments, all Judaism comes from the Torah. But you don't have the Torah, there's no more Judaism. Torah is the source of all of Judaism. The learning Torah is the most important commandment. Not only that, even if you don't learn Torah to know what to do, to know what to do, you can learn very quickly. You can learn just a, a one week. There's a, a commandment to learn Torah <coughs> Constantly, just learning Torah, saying the words of Torah, trying to understand the different arguments, the different aspects, the different facets of the Torah, the simple meaning, the homiletic meaning, the, the midrashic meaning, the, the, the Kabbalistic meaning. Here we have the Hasidic meaning. All the different facets and all the different opinions of the genuine rabbis to learn those opinions, that's a commandment. <clears throat> to learn all the laws, the details of the laws, to learn all the midrash, to learn... Sometimes it says learning Torah is the most important thing because the words of Torah, even as they come through the Talmud and the, the words of Rabbi Akiva or Rabbi Lokesh or whatever, is that those are the words of God. <clears throat> so sometimes it says the learning the Torah, that's the main thing. Palm, it says, Hifligu ma'od b'sheva humalas And some, other times it says, no, the main thing is prayer. <clears throat> the prayer is in the place of the sacrifices. Sacrifices are the are the basis of Judaism. Sacrifice is the holy temple. We're praying every day, right? God, bring back the holy temple again. 
Devir Beisecha, right? With the Ach, but Shneim, both of them are true. What's the big, what's the most important thing? Torah or prayer? Ki Heim Chalukim Binyanim. Both of them are important. Both of them are essential. But in, in different aspects, <coughs> prayer is Bechinas Milamat Lamaila. Prayer is from below to above. Prayer is like fire. <coughs> we give ourselves up to God, like the sacrifices. We think about God, contemplate God, how good God is, how awesome God is, how merciful God is, how close God is, how far God is, how God creates the world, he creates me. <clears throat> we appreciate God, surrender to God. That's prayer. Torah is from above to below. The Torah is already there. This is pure God's will, God's wisdom. When we say the words of Torah, these are the words that God already spoke, and they're just coming through me into the world, from above to below, just like the giving of the Torah. The giving of the Torah was God came from above, and he gave it in the world. So prayer is for us from below to above. There was also two aspects that were in the Holy Temple. <clears throat> in the Holy Temple, there was the outer altar, that was the sacrifices, and then there was the ark in the inside, the aron, and that was the tablets. The Ramban says the main thing in the Holy Temple were the tablets. That's why the first thing that's mentioned in the vessels are how to make this ark. And the, the, the Maimonides says the main thing was the altar. That was the main thing with the sacrifice sacrifices. Both of them are important, right? And the, all, the, the ark, that's Torah. And the sacrifices, that's prayer. Well, beer, Indian, let's explain this. Tihine, Indian, the whole idea of prayer. This is doing the commandment of Kriya Shema. What's the Kriya Shema? Vyahavta, loving God. There's a commandment in the Torah <clears throat> that you have to love God. This is the motto of Judaism. The motto of Judaism is Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Yechod. Shema means understand. You have to understand God. You have to try to understand God as much as you can. And the more you understand about God, you understand more about how good he is, how close he is, how real he is, and you start to love God. That's doing the commandment of Shema Yisrael v'ahavta. You must love God, right? The, the, that motto of God, the six words, if you look in the Torah, it is followed by the commandment of loving God. You have to love God, commandment. You have to love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your might. It's a commandment. And there's explanations what it means, all of your heart, with all of your soul, what, type of, what can bring you to this type of love, what it implies. But nevertheless, you, it, it's a commandment in the Torah that you must love God. Love God. And you have to think about it. Shema means to think. You have to think about it. You have to try to understand it. You have to contemplate. Like it says in another place. <clears throat> it was established also. Call Seder to feel the whole order of prayer. Before we say Shema. Right? If you look in a, a Jewish prayer book. You'll see that there's all these prayers. You get the Shema, that's like right in the sort of the middle. That's the high, po high point. Shema, and then you have Shmon Esrei. Kadei, in order, Shekabel Alav, Be'ekriya Shema, Be'ahavta. You have to think about God <clears throat> and all of the prayers that we have before Shema <clears throat> in order that we can actually do genuinely loving God truthfully. Kamoshi Isbur, the common Others. And so there's a lot of opinions that this also applies to non-Jews as well, because the same God that's creating the Jews is creating the non-Jews. <clears throat> and just like a, every human being has to appreciate that God is creating him. And when we do appreciate that fact, and we realize it, then you have come to a love of God. God alone, the creator. He may behold that there may be a Adam the Ahava, the Ray way that a person can come to this love. <clears throat> How do we come to this love? It's so important. How do we do it? This is what it says in the Torah. I have given before you today at the God said this is later on in the book of Deuteronomy. I have given you in front of you the life today. Life and good and death and bad, choose life. 
It says, what does it mean to choose life? Loving God. Because he's your life. <clears throat> right, now the Rebbe has not uh, left the original topic. The Rebbe has not left the original topic. The original topic is, how is it that when, God forbid, bad things happen to a person, that really that's good, and that elevates his head. That elevates him. This is really God embracing him. How does that? doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> Especially it doesn't make any sense because, <clears throat> I mean, what do a lot of people say? Uh, listen, you know, it, it's, in this world you, world you suffer, and then in the world to come, you get benefit. That's also true. That's also true. But that's not the point the Rebbe wants to give you. <clears throat> when Mashiach comes, which he should come any second now, <clears throat> when Mashiach comes, the whole essence of Mashiach is the world will be good. There won't be any more suffering. There won't be any more <clears throat> sickness. There won't be war. There won't be famine. There won't be lacking. Nobody will be blind. Nobody will be deaf. Bad things won't happen. Bad things, according to all opinions, are not good. Bad things are not good. A person stubs his toe. That's not a good thing. You can't see somebody stubs his toe. And say, oh, this is that's good that you stubbed your toe. Right? <clears throat> it could have been worse. It could have been that I stubbed my toe. I, right? That you stuff. <coughs> I once went into a store, <coughs> an office, and the, 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 it was the head of the head of this, whatever, what was it? <coughs> Lawyer or something. Anyway, so he had a sign on his, on his wall. <coughs> the main thing in life is not whether you succeed or fail. The main thing in life is whether I succeed or fail. <clears throat> Good when something happens bad to somebody else, so you can make all sorts of philosophies. When it happens, God forbid, to a person himself, or God forbid to to, <clears throat> to somebody else, but it happens to the person himself, all of a sudden it's a little bit more difficult. Really, it should be the opposite. When something bad happens to me, God forbid, is then I should philosophize about it. When it happens to somebody else, I can't, you know, I can't <clears throat> philosophize on somebody else's pain. But nevertheless, the Rebbe is, and the Rebbe is saying that anything time that something bad happens, <clears throat> it's always somehow or other God showing us love. How is that? So the Rebbe said, let me explain. First of all, you have to understand that we have this dynamic relationship with God. Prayer is going up. <clears throat> Learning Torah is coming down. Let's talk about prayer. Prayer is going up. <laughs> what, how, what are we supposed to think about? Going up in love. We love God. How do you come to love? This is the motto of Judaism. Listen, Jews, God is our God, God is one, and you should love God. <clears throat> love God. <clears throat> How do you come to love God? First of all, think, am I alive? Yes. Where did I get my life from? This is God's, what do you call it, signature, his calling card. If I am alive, it's a sign that God is enlivening me. Where do I get my life? I get my life from my mother and my father. I get my life from the air. Where do I get my life from? From life. And just that's it. That just things just life. It's just you know that's the way you come out of the womb, right? Squirrels are alive, plants are alive, <clears throat> everything. Is alive. I'm also alive. What's the big deal? Yes, of course. That you can certainly think that way. You can certainly think that way, but you won't come to love God. The commandment of of Judaism is to love God, the source of your life. Everything there is in this world, there's spiritual. And there's physical, there's, there's physical and there's spiritual. <clears throat> Everything in the world has the outside and the inside. Baruchnius, Vachayus, and the spiritual and life, Eloke, who Chayim Vatov is good. It's life and it's good. Vagashmius and physical is Mavis Vara. It's death and it's bad. Shu Kala Benifsa, because it goes away. From this, you're a dumb, a person can see. <clears throat> Just like the physicality of everything. Is secondary to the spiritual, which enlivens it. Also on a person. Right? Look at the world, see the birds, the plants. Right? The main thing is the spiritual force, the life inside of them. As soon as the life goes away, that's it. The animal, the plant, whatever it is, if it dies, it smells terrible. You want to get it out of it, 
right? When it's alive, wonderful, right? You have a pet dog, a pet cat. You have a beautiful garden. Wonderful. It's wonderful. As soon as they die, terrible. You don't even want to go out and look at it anymore, right? Everything is all, it, it's the opposite of life. It makes you sad. It makes you miserable, <laughs> disgusted. Also, in a person himself, the body is secondary to the spiritual. As long as a person, <clears throat> and the life which is inside of it. And therefore, therefore, a person loves life very much, unless he's sick. A normal human being loves life. He wants to be alive. He wants to stay alive. <clears throat> right? How do people steal from other people? <clears throat> Generally, you take a gun. Take a gun, you threaten somebody's life, and you steal from the person. That's when, because life is very, very precious. <clears throat> life is a very, very precious thing. Life is, I mean, there's a joke that says if you have a gun, you can go and rob a bank. You can, you can rob one bank, but if you have a bank, you can rob everybody. Okay, that's a different type of, <laughs> different type of, of, uh, <clears throat> of appreciation of life. People, genuine, generally speaking, uh, life is precious. A normal person, life is precious. But where does life come from? Nobody knows. Can be yotem and much more so. A person should love God. If you love your life, for sure you should love God. When you look at your mind's eye, Maria Hushis, with a clear eye, you can see. Shehu chayecha, God is your life. Shu makar chayechaim, that God is the source and He's the life of all lives, the source of all life. If you want to ignore this, you can ignore it. But as soon as you look at life, you can start to see that it's a very <clears throat> unexplainable thing, right? Science cannot explain what life is. They can explain how it moves. They can't explain any aspect of life. They can't explain what is consciousness. They can't explain what is love. They can't explain what is value, what is courage, what is genius. They can't explain any of these things because these are things which come from life. <clears throat> In, in the cults of, and as soon as they do, these psychiatrists, psychologists, they try, so they, they minimize everything. Right? They, 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 how do you say? They kill it. All the hosts of heaven will bow down to you. Like the rabbis say, that the sun sinks in the west. Why? Because it's bowing down to its kona, to its creator. The Cain call of Maslow's and also all of the heavens, <clears throat> Babur, because they're all bowing down to God. Sharuim and Masig of Chayusim, because they, they <clears throat> grasp their life. Now, this is going according to the opinion that the earth is standing still and the whole heavens, they're moving around. Which you could say, you know, well, science has proved this is not true. Well, the fact that science did not prove that it's not true, but it's certainly the way that science has explained it that the earth is just moving around, it works. But it also works to say that the earth is standing still and everything is going around. What's the proof? The Jewish people, before the scientists came along, Galileo, whoever came along, Copernicus, <clears throat> they were making, calculating the months and the places of the stars, right? They were cal calculating these things according to the, <clears throat> the theory that it's the sun is going around the earth and not the other way around. And all their calculations were accurate, even though they're a little bit more difficult. <clears throat> so the, the whole heavens are bowing down to God. <clears throat> Look, I have given for you a person can see with his eyes. Shahari Roa, Chayusa, a person just looks at your life. You don't believe the sun is going around the earth. Okay, don't, don't think about that. Think about how you're being enlivened. <clears throat> you can see that he's alive <clears throat> by means of this. He comes to love God. If the heavens, the stars, the sky, my life is so unexplainable how they got there, and how they are, right? <clears throat> and of course, you can't explain it. There's ways you can explain it according to science. The scientists are not stupid people, right? There's not, what is it, uh, you know, the theory, different theories of gravity, Einstein's theory of gravity, and things like that. There's ways of explaining right, how it moves. But who made up these laws? Who made the laws? 
And even though that, that, that life comes in an orderly fashion and the heart breaks and etc., but what exactly life is, nobody can understand. Says the Rebbe, my explanation is it's God. <clears throat> That's the explanation of Judaism. That's what Abraham realized. Then, as soon as you realize this, then as much as you love yourself, you'll love God even more. You'll come to love God even with your Yetzir Hora, even with your selfish impulses. It will be negated to the love of God. Like the rabbis say, negate your will in front of God's will. Perish Lafisha Avazu because this love comes because that you see and you feel that God really exists. And Kazu ain't a so there's nothing comparable to God. Valonium Sadugma, so there's no comparison whatsoever to our physical eyes. Kamaimer, me the Melach, who is similar to you, God, who can be equal to you, God, who can be compared to you. So there's let, let me just give an example. It says that in, in uh, <clears throat> in the Talmud, it's it's really in Ein Yaakov, it says that a thief, before he, before he comes to steal, he prays to God for success. So here we have a thief, and he believes in God, and he prays to God that he should succeed. But what's he doing? He's doing a sin, doing a bad thing. So he <clears throat> said, listen, that that he's praying to God is a very is praiseworthy. I mean, it's a praiseworthy thing. He's praying to God, and he really believes in God. And also he's brave, you know, to go and steal from people. It's a brave thing. He might get caught. He might get killed. It's a dangerous business. So he turns to God for, you know, support and for help and for success. And he'll give, and it could be that if he steals successfully, he'll give some of the money to the, you know, yeshivas and to the, this, because he's grateful to God. They gave him the, what's wrong over here? What's wrong with a person like that? Is that he doesn't really love God. He loves himself. He loves himself. And because he loves himself, so therefore, he wants to steal. It says in the Torah that you're not supposed to steal, right? But he needs the money, or at least he imagines that he needs the money, or at least he's good at stealing, whatever it is. That's his thing. <clears throat> but if he really loved God, he felt God like he feels himself. So he would take that into consideration. One minute, God does not want me to steal. He says, but what, what about me? Where am I going to get money from? I, I want you know, I want to buy a new car. I want to impress my 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 wife. I want to, you know, have a nice clothes. Where am I going to get all this stuff from? You know, I have to do. So it says, one second, I want to steal. I want, but God doesn't want me to. Who do I love more? So if this final decision is that he loves, he feels love and he values himself more. So he'll do what he wants. If he really has a feeling of love for the creator, love, feeling, then he's going to do what the creator wants. And the creator is good. The creator provides. There was a person who wrote a letter to the Rebbe, and Lubavitcher Rebbe, and he said that I can't work on, I can't rest on Shabbos. I can't not work on, I have to work on Shabbos. On Shabbos, I earn like three times as much as every other day. Maybe as a taxi cab driver or whatever. And I have a family, I have to support the family. And if I don't, you know, I, as it is, I just make ends meet. And um, I have to work on Shabbos. So the Rebbe wrote back to him, and he said that, you know, if you believe in God, so you'll understand that God provides food for six, seven billion people. At that time, this was like the letter was written 50 years ago. <clears throat> six, seven billion people. If God can feed seven billion people, you think he's going to have a problem feeding one more? You do what God wants, and God will provide for you, Right? And I have a personal story that it happened that way, but it's, it's a bit of a long story. But I, I used to have a Chabad house in a place called Or Yehuda, and the the I convinced the cab company not to work on Shabbos. They didn't work on Shabbos, and they were all yelling and screaming. And some of them at me, they sort of respected me, but they were yelling and screaming at each other. That's impossible. And you know, some of them said. And finally, they made a decision. Listen, we're not even going to work from our houses. We're going to because people will see our car going. They'll see us. We're not going to work on Shabbat. So they didn't. They didn't work on Shabbat. And there came one week and they were all yelling and screaming in two weeks. And it came at the end of like two months. And they made another meeting together. That was the agreement. And they said, listen, the fact is we're, everybody's earning less money. Everybody's earning less money. We used to take home, you know, like uh, what is 5,000 shekels of liras, whatever it was. Um, and now everybody's taking home 3,000. Said, but we all talked about it. 
in a calm way. And it ended up that we end, we're making the month, we're finishing the month with the same, you know, bank account. We don't have any more debts or whatever, maybe a little bit more, but we're sitting at home with the family. You know, we're at home with the family. We eat a meal together with the family. You know, it's a whole new value. All of a sudden, we, <clears throat> we're, we're a little one day of rest, of calmness, at least to, to sleep the whole day or to go to the synagogue, you know, for a couple of minutes to do something. You know, we're doing what our grandfathers did and our great-great-grandfathers did. And in the end, they were very grateful. You know, they were very grateful. So it came out, yes, they, they did earn less money. But the money, the same money that they had, it, it bought the same type of things. So, but the point of it is, there has to be an appreciation, a love, a recognition, a connection to God. When a person has this connection to God, so everything is totally different. We're going to see what this has to do with the left hand and the right hand, God willing, tomorrow. Now let's learn the Devar Malchut.